And we stood to sing that he restores or he renews us day by day. We stood to sing he renews us day by day. Uh, that's the theme of our text this morning, that God does renew us. He gives us designated times of rest. Does anybody need rest? Could you wait till after the service? <laughs> we need rest. Our Lord knows that. He knows our frame. He made us, understands what we need. If you have your Bibles, would you find Mark chapter 6? If you don't have a Bible with you, there's probably one located close, one close to you. Grab it. Um, Mark chapter 6. We're going to read verses 30 through 32, Mark chapter 6. I want to ask you, once you found your place in Mark 6 verse 30, if you'd stand with me. I'm going to read through verse 32. Mark chapter 6 verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus. Well, where had they been? Well, they'd been out doing what Jesus had been doing. Jesus had the disciples accompany him as he did, did his work and his ministry. Jesus did great works, and he taught, and he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. The disciples would watch Jesus do this work, but there would be a time that these who accompanied Jesus would be sent out on assignment for Jesus. In other words, Jesus is doing what you know is important in life, and that is to delegate responsibility. So these disciples, after having received an assignment, a delegated responsibility, they come back to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Hey, just another good word here about good leadership. Jesus not only sent the disciples out on assignment, after having taught them what to do, um, he brings them back for accountability. And then he affirms them. Verse 31, he said, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. All right, so these disciples are working so hard that there's no time to eat. It doesn't mean they can't grab a sandwich. <laughs> it doesn't mean they can't grab a snack. It means they can't, don't have time to sit down around a table and go through the process of first century Jewish fellowship around a meal. They don't have time for that. So Jesus says, we're going to take time. The need's still there. People are still sick. People are still lost. There are folks clamoring to meet Jesus, but Jesus says, time out. Guys, let's get out of here. And he says to them uh, in verse 32, and they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray for God's help. Father, thank you that you, your spirit spoke to men and moved them along as they wrote. And thank you that the same spirit that inspired the text we read this morning lives in us as believers. And though you have inspired this word, you also interpret it for us. And we need your help for that. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, if you're joining us for the first time or haven't been here to our church in a while, we're continuing a study through the gospel according to Mark. We've entitled this study, Follow Me. Jesus said to his disciples, follow me, and I will make you. I will make you. What will you make them, Jesus? I will make them fishers of men. Jesus is going to make us something if we follow him. He's going to make us into not only fishers of men, but someone like Jesus as we follow him in his rhythms. Every one of us have rhythms of life. It's what you do. It's what you get into. It's your habits. It's your disciplines. It's what your daily life consists of. And if you follow Jesus in his rhythms of life, you're going to become like Jesus. To follow Jesus is to follow him in these patterns. Living Jesus' rhythms means aligning our lives to his life and purposes. It's walking in steps with the Holy Spirit, following his example, the Lord Jesus' example of loving and compassionate ministry, even hard labor that's meaningful, but as well, don't miss it, designated times of rest. The 12 disciples had just completed a mission. They'd been extended beyond any way they thought they'd ever be stretched. Uh, they had people receive the Lord, and they had people reject the Lord. They had great experiences. They had 
experiences that left them heartbroken and they were tired and worn thin. Jesus knew this. And that's why Jesus said, come away, because Jesus knew their soul needed care. And it's true for us today that the Lord knows our soul and he understands we need care. This is a practical message for all of us, all of us. And in the first part of this message, I, I want to be as practical as possible as a pastor, as a person who wants to show you love and shepherd you, because there is not one person in this room who's not ever experienced being worn thin. You know what it's like to be wore out. You know what it's like to be exhausted and tired. Life itself can be tiring, and there's no snooze button on life, is there? Work can be exhausting. It might be exhilarating at times, but there's those deadlines and responsibilities that can leave us spiritually, mentally, and physically wore out. We have emotional distresses. We deal with life's difficulties, don't we? We have relational issues. We have emotional challenges that can drain us of our energy and resilience. We have the good feelings sometimes of work and the good feelings and emotions that come from emptying our inbox. It's wonderful when the stress is left and you see no emails. It's also distressing emotionally when you accidentally hit reply all with that meme you didn't mean to send to everybody. We have general responsibilities, the balancing of family responsibilities and home life and schedules, and they can be overwhelming, particularly for those of us who have multiple roles to fill, and it's probably just about everyone in here. And how do we get a balance in life and work? How are we able to rejoice and rest appropriately? Balance keeps relational life healthy. Warren Wiersbe, whom we use some of his material quite often to teach our Bible studies, and was a great teacher of God's Word, said, if there were ever another beatitude in the Sermon on the Mount, the blessings, the beatitudes, he said, if there were another one added, it might be blessed are the balanced How often has a dad come to me and said, "Uh, Scott, I just want to find balance between my work life and my home life. Why? Because the inevitable conflict of work and our relational life comes at various points in the seasons of our life. Work is not a curse, is it? I mean, God gave work before there was a fall, before there was corruption of sin. But what sin brought was weeds into the crop, thorns into the field, and opportunities for stress fractures to take place in our relational lives, the conflict of work and life. Uh, Our home life needs work. All of our relationships at home, our friendships, even our faith family here remain healthy when we give time to one another. Vibrant relationships with the Lord require, I don't mean it's a good idea, but I mean it requires, if you're going to have a vibrant relationship with the Lord, it requires time time with Him. Why? Because God is far more concerned in what we should be than what we do. The disciples had, did, had done a great work. They'd done much, but the Lord said, you got to come away, because He was far more concerned about who they were than what they did. Aren't you glad today that the Lord thinks that of you? He rewards what we do, but He cares about who we are. Successful work often means completing tasks, Right? And there are a lot to be completed. I have young dads who I've met with who had to learn lessons like I've learned over the years and sometimes had to learn the hard way that our family needs us more than our work needs us. And sometimes, y'all, more than the church needs us. And young moms need to be encouraged today because the hardest work you do is the work in the home. Whether you work outside the home or work inside the home, you know it's hard work. And I recall the time that we made the decision that Les would stay home with our kids. And she had a great job, made more money than I did, but we're going to stay home. And I remember hearing ladies sometimes who worked outside the home ask her, so what do you do? And she said, I, I, I'm, I keep my home. And they said, well, what do you do all day? If they just stayed home for a little while, they would understand what is done all day. Work is tiring. It's hard. It's difficult. If you have lots of work to do, then you have lots of tasks to complete. If you have more than one responsibility, there's always a checklist. But there has to be time that not only do we check things off, but we check in on those that we love. Jesus took time. Notice this 
in the text. Jesus took time to check in on his disciples. Not just check out what they did. And won't they need this? These are men that are going to be used to turn the world upside down. There will be not much rest in their future. Not a whole lot of time to sit on their hands. They probably won't take up a lot of hobbies. They're going to need time to rest. In fact, Peter said, make every effort to add to your faith. What he meant by that is take time, slow down, and add to your soul. You are a soul with a body. Your body gets wore out, but so can your soul. Paul said it this way. He said, man, I have had beatings and tortures and shipwrecks and robbery. And on top of this, the emotional distress, if you will, of the care of the churches. He said, sometimes that I was anxious for the work of the church. And he had to learn that God would rescue him in his weakness. And that he would say, I've learned that God's grace is sufficient even when I'm weak. The man God used to go into this world to begin what is known as the church and to give us the apostles' doctrine needed time to rest, to reload, and redeploy. And if they did, so do we. So do we. But why don't we? Why don't we? Time is so hard to find. Why do we feel like sometimes we're pressed for time, running behind, never enough hours in the day, or running out of time? We're experiencing what social scientists call time poverty. Uh, In an article from Harvard Business School, I read how that, of all all things, uh, Christmas letters were examined from the 1960s to the present. You know, the letters you get where people tell you everything going on in their life and their family and their family's cat and dog and I love those because you do really get an insight in on people's family and know what's going on and and learn a lot. But what was discovered by Harvard Business School is that this phrase of our schedules are crazy or crazy schedules had increased 80% since 1960. Crazy schedules. No doubt we're tired. Why are we allowing ourselves to become so busy? If you ask somebody how they're doing, sometimes they say, well, (laughs) not I'm fine or good or blessed, I'm busy. We may have thought that technology would free us up from overwork, but in reality, home and even our pocket has become our office. Carrie Newhoff, who studies church life, said, you used to go to the office, but thanks to technology, the office goes to you. And it's true, isn't it? We are always bombarded with, with so much information. It's hard to turn it off. It's hard, really hard to turn away. And we become tired. And oftentimes, being tired is seen as a badge of honor. I'm just wore out. I've got receipts to prove it. Dr. Paul Adolph, in a book that I was reading on Mistakes Leaders Make by Leslie Finn, said that he had met with a missionary who had never taken a vacation and bragged constantly that he worked tirelessly without vacations, but became so exhausted he had to go to this medical doctor for help. He couldn't relax. He couldn't sleep. And so the doctor spent time in therapy with him, getting him ready to be redeployed. Here's what he said, it took roughly the equivalent of one month vacation for each of those 10 years before he could resume his ministry. It would have been better had the man just taken a vacation. John Hopkins said this, as we compete to be productive, busyness is as much a status symbol as anything else. But of course, for business, there's help. For being wore out, there are some supports. There's caffeine and energy drinks and B12 shots and on and on it goes, right? But busyness could be the byproduct, not only of our insecurities, of keeping our job, but result of perfectionism or even escapism. Some people are busy because they don't want to go home. They don't want to deal with what really matters and the important things of life. We become busy. Someone said, if the devil can't make you bad, he will make you busy. But C.S. Lewis took it a step further. He said, sometimes the devil will make you be about not a lot of things, but about nothing at all. In a letter that a demon, a devil, wrote to his protege, Wormwood, in the Screwtape Letters. C.S. Lewis said, Christians can recognize that the enemy is one whom nothing is strong. It was a double entendre to say, sometimes it's nothing that we get our attention on and nothing is strong. The book went on to say in this fictional tale of a devil working with his protege to deceive a Christian, strong enough to steal away a man's best years, is not sweet sins, but in the dreary flickering of the mind over what it knows not 
or knows not why. It is the gratification of curiosity that is feeble that a man is not even aware of. Christians focused on nothing at all of lasting significance. In that book, he said they can focus on a fire in a cold room. But in our day, it's not a fire. It's a flickering television. It's a Netflix series. It's, it's, it's a Facebook post. It's scrolling on nauseam. Cole Thomas, pastor here, gave me this from a book that he was reading. The average iPhone user touches his phone 2,617 times a day. Each user is on his phone for an average of two and a half hours over 76 sessions. What is this called? What is this caused? He said, the writer, this is called a deficit attention span in human beings. The average attention span for humans in the year 2000, before the digital revolution, the average attention span was 12 seconds. That's not very long, but it's a lot longer than it is now because of the digital revolution we're in and the videos that come at us so quickly, and the images that we are regularly seeing, the average attention span of a human is no more than five seconds. Compare that with a goldfish who has the attention span of nine seconds, the author says. (laughs) Cole interjected, you know what? We're losing the goldfish. (laughs) Whatever the reason for our overwork, compulsive behaviors, or fear of missing out, We can become so distracted by synthetic substitutes for soul-nourishing food. But however, I want you to see this text because Jesus will lead us in the rhythms of life for nourishment through energizing exertion and soul-nourishing refreshing. And, And we need both. We need work and rest. Both work and rest can be invigorating when we follow Jesus in his steps. Uh, Look in the text, verse 30. Let's jump into it. And I want you to write some notes down here because I think this is really helpful for us to see what Jesus leads us to do as we follow him. You see, if we follow Jesus, we'll follow the pattern of expending ourselves in work and then coming in to be refreshed. Both. It's expending ourselves in work and coming in to be refreshed. Verse 30, the apostles. Stop there. Underline the word apostle. The word apostle is in the lower case. It is not here the the office these men will one day have, which will be very much prominent in the pages to come in the New Testament, but is a description of what they do. In the same chapter we're studying in verse 7, in verse 7 of chapter 6, Jesus called the men together and then sent them out. And that's the idea of what an apostle does. In fact, the word apostle means sent one. Jesus was the ultimate apostle, according to Hebrews 3, who was sent by God to lost people. These apostles were sent out, and in the same way, you and I have been sent out to those who are lost. So the disciples have been given a designated and delegated assignment. Jesus delegated an assignment that thrilled them. They couldn't wait to come back and tell Jesus about that. Why? Because the disciples went in that assignment with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the same chapter, Mark 6, We're told they went out two by two, and Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits. Do you know that you too have been given an assignment by the Lord to go out into this world for those who are far from God? But you also, you also, also have been sent out with authority and power. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. If you've been in a Baptist church any time, you know this passage. It is the passage that says, go make disciples. Have you heard it before? Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And then here's a key to this passage that sometimes we, we, we go and kind of just pass over. And, and that is that he will be with us. He will be with us. But he will be with us just before that he said, all authority has been given to me and I will be with you. As you go and I go, we are energized in the assignment God has given us to See people come to faith in Jesus Christ by His Holy Spirit's presence in us, who directs our steps. You know, for years, and even now, we as a church pray regularly, God, direct our steps. We prayed that prayer early on as a church because we knew that Holy Spirit leadership is better than human strategy. This really got kind of laid on me at some of the conferences I went to when I was first a pastor and, you know, we were meeting in elementary school, and, you know, it was fun in that elementary school. You've heard some of the stories. Um, it, it was fun to, to, to wipe peanut butter and jelly off chairs that were about that wide and couldn't control the air conditioner or the heater, but we were there. It was good. It was good for a season. We enjoyed it. But I was trying to learn as much as I can learn, still do, still want to learn as much as I can learn. In these conferences, people would say things like this. Now, if your church is going to grow, here are the things you need to do. 
You follow me? Here are the things you need to do. And, and, uh, and listen, literally, this, this would happen more often than you would imagine. We're at church conferences, and, um, and these conferences would say, here's the things you need to do. And, and, and this is somewhat said, somewhat said in some way, just about every conference I was going to, hey, you know you need to pray, we know we need to trust God, but here are the things you need to do. As if prayer, Holy Spirit leadership, that's secondary. But the things you need to do are, you need to be real friendly. Thank God for this church. Last week, just like every week I've been here, every week I've been here, someone has made this testimony. Last week, someone said to me, I came to this church because I, when I came in, I was loved and received and I felt welcomed. Praise God for that, right? I hear that every week. Thank God that you are a friendly, welcoming church. You care for the souls of others. But that's not the thing. And the thing isn't what we do or how we do it, but in what power we do it. And this means even in your own life, you and I are energized not by what we do, but by who does it through us. And we have the Holy Spirit who walks right with us and directs our steps so that sometimes we are interrupted in our schedule. But because we are directed by the Holy Spirit, we recognize this is not an interruption. This is a divine appointment. Have you had those lately? You're like, what's going on? Why, what's, what's happened here? And then you realize, wait a minute, God's in this. He not only directs our lives, but he directs us to magnify Jesus through our lives. Just this week, one of our ladies at our church got a new job, and she's, she's not had a chance to share her faith there yet. However, she gave this testimony. I've just been working there a little while, and people don't know that I'm a Christian, but they already apologize to me when they use bad language. What's going on there? Jesus is being magnified through her as she follows in his steps in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he gives us what we need to say when we need to say it. Our lifestyle evangelism is also backed up by what we say. In other words, the disciples went out and did good works, but they also proclaimed Jesus. And this is the way in which you and I have been assigned. Romans 10 says, how in the world will they ever hear? I added that part. But how will they ever hear in whom they not believe? And how will they out there believe if they never heard? And how are they going to hear unless someone preaches? And how are they going to preach unless they are sent? Do you follow Paul's reasoning? Hey, we get it. They're not going to hear out there because we have the right strategy. Because we're really smart. Because we have good events and programs. They hear because we take the assignment seriously. And we go out and share in the power and authority of the Holy Spirit what it means to know Jesus Christ. Jesus has not only sent pastors and missionaries to present the gospel, he has sent you. You are a designated missionary for Jesus Christ. Listen to this verse and just kind of scratch your head with me. Jesus said, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. That's great. Got it. But then he said this, head scratcher, and greater works than these will he do. Huh? I, I, I've never raised anyone from the dead. I've never healed anyone. I've never met a blind person and, and said, okay, have sight. How am I going to do greater works than Jesus? Here's how. Because we are delegated people, the body of Christ, who are in multiple different locations doing what Jesus did on mission, seeking to see the lost saved. D.L. Moody was a soul winner and a Sunday school teacher and won thousands of little boys to Christ and was in, encouraging other men to join him. Ken, you're, you're shaking your head. You'll, 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 you'll love this. He said, D.L. Moody, this layman who was winning thousands to Jesus, he said, I'd rather have 10 men do the work than to do the work of 10 men. That's the idea. Let me illustrate this a little bit, what Jesus is doing here for us. Because the work of evangelism can't be everybody's job. It's just not, every, hey, let me just, listen, some of you are like, oh, great, this is that message where he's telling me that I got to share my faith. It's not everybody's job. It's your job. We, we, we are regularly hearing about socialism and communism. Did you know in the Soviet Union, when it was intact, 90% of the food came from 10% of the farms in the Soviet Union that were outside the Soviet Union? I should say. In fact, only 10% of the food in the Soviet Union actually came from farms in the Soviet Union. 
And it's not because the Soviet Union doesn't have fertile ground and wonderful places to farm. It's because the farms under the, the previous Soviet Union were collective lands, which everyone who was a farmer joined in with others without personal investment and personal ownership. So crops literally were grown and would rot in the fields because nobody cared enough to go and get them out of the fields and feed the nation. In fact, one Iowan farmer, one farmer from Iowa could produce enough food to feed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Russians would outdo thousands of farms literally in Russia. Why? Because that one farmer took personal interest in his own field and his own crops. It's the difference between a free society and a communistic society. Y'all, listen. It is the difference between in a free society take responsibility for our own personal assignments and thinking, no, that's somebody else's job. In the same way, if you'll follow this, it's all of our job to do the the work of ministry and evangelism, not just the pastors, but it's your job. It's your job to take it seriously and to take it personally. Every person needs to see how important this work is. Everyone does. And people outside are hungry for the word. They are desirous to hear the word. Far more so, and we can say this till Jesus comes, and it's true. There are more people who want to hear than there are people who are willing to tell. I I got this text from Joe Johnson last night. Hey, Pastor Scott, we just wanted to share with you from the faith writers who were at the Clay County Fair that we presented the gospel 116 times, and 18 people came to faith in Jesus Christ, y'all, at the Clay County Fair. So praise be to God, because we have a tent that our church is responsible for that you can jump in on if you want to go to Connect Point today and say, all right, I'll jump in. Let me, let, let, me, let, me, let me watch how people do it. You never shared Jesus? Stand around and watch them do it. And you'll see what God does as you there pray and help others. You say, I've got some training. I've got some, use your training. You heard about the lady that had first aid training, and she said, I'm so glad I had it because I came up on an accident. There were bodies everywhere. Whoo, I was so glad I had first aid training. Her friend said, well, what did you do? She said, I'll remember my training that when you get nauseous, you put your head between your knees. I'd have passed out if I hadn't remembered my training. Some of you have been trained in evangelism for so long, but you haven't used the training that you have, the testimony that God's given you. You can, you can do that. Why well, people are hungry. I mean, people are going to the fair for the four food groups. You know that? I mean, like, people are going to the fair for a lot of reasons, but they're going for the four food groups. They're going for fried, deep fried, sugar covered, and on a stick. But what they got this week with people sharing the gospel is soul-nourishing food that really everyone's hungry for. Adrian Rogers put it this way, all men have the same heartaches. They do, don't they? All men have the same hunger. All men have the same hope, Jesus. And all men have the same help. And guess who the help is? It's you. Did you recognize that carrying out the work of the Great Commission can actually energize you? Think about Jesus as you follow him in the rhythms of life. Jesus, in the rhythms of life, met with a woman who needed to be saved. She was saved. The disciples show up. I'm going to paraphrase here. They said, you want something to eat? He said, I've already eaten. They began talking about amongst each other who, who fed him. Somebody bring him a sandwich, what's up? Then Jesus, hearing that, said, and this is where I'm not paraphrasing, I'll quote, he said, I have food that you know not of. And then he said, a few verses later, my food is to do the will of my Father. In other words, Jesus was energized by doing work. Did you know you can be energized by doing work, by doing the work in the Word? I was in Bible study this morning. I can tell you I've had incredible Bible study teachers. I hated having to leave our 915 hour when it was 915 with Matt to go to our 8 o'clock. But I have great teachers. And this morning, one of our teachers was teaching. And I'm sitting there absolutely amazed as he is pouring out his soul. And my soul is being fed by the Word of God. It was absolutely refreshing and replenishing. This is why I want you to know that you are and can be invigorated and energized in the work. Some of you are like, I'm not growing up. I'm a little dry. Well, are you working? Are you serving? And are you being refilled in times and designated times of rest with the word being poured into you? I may not be like you. I don't think I'm really unique, but I don't think, I don't think anybody can miss church a whole long time without being emptied. I miss church sometimes. Every once in a while, God's been gracious to me over my course of my life of being healthy, but I've missed 
you know, maybe once being sick, and I really miss it. I miss on vacation, being here around God's people. I miss it. I don't think I'm unique. I don't only miss it. I need it, y'all. I need the accountability. I need the encouragement. I need the word. And, and I don't think I'm the weakest Christian in the world. I'm not the strongest. I'm not the weakest. I just don't think I'm unique in that. How can we go days and weeks without being replenished by God's word? You see, when you follow Jesus, you get in the pattern of expending yourself and coming back to be refreshed. And you'll be sent out, you'll be brought in. Look at this text, verse 30. The apostles came, Jesus saw and heard what they'd done. He held them accountable. We are accountable, y'all. We're accountable for everything that God's entrusted us with. Like, for instance, we are to be good stewards, 1 Corinthians 4, with what we own. Like, we're going to give an account for what we own. What do you do with your money? But we're also going to be given an account one day at a final evaluation for what we've done with the gospel. We are not only stewards of physical possessions, we are stewards of treasure called the gospel. And we're going to be held, held in account. One day, everyone, every person in this room is going to give an account. And you're going to be evaluated for your work or lack thereof. There will be a final performance review. You won't escape it. This is why it's important so imperative that we regularly evaluate our work. The disciples said, here's what we've done. Here's what we said. Okay, let's come away. Let's talk about it. It's just a reminder, too, we don't do what we do for people. This is when you really get burned. And I'm very sensitive here because I get where some of you might be hurt. Don't want to make light, and I'm not, not going to do that. But there are too many testimonies of, oh, I got hurt at church. What were you doing your work for at church? Who were you serving at church? There's never a right or a reason for a church to abuse anyone or use anyone. However, if you've served the Lord, you will be used. You will be expended. You will go and tirelessly work for the Lord. And in those moments, there is this reminder, I need to evaluate, why am I doing what am I doing, I'm doing? And then I need to come away sometimes, secondly, and rest. Hey, let's go. Hey, he, Jesus told the boys to get in the boat. Let's get in the boat. Not a boat, the boat. I like that. And here's why. Because the boat was the place probably where they had a lot of lessons, and it was a place of rest for them. The boat. Every one of us needs a place of rest. And then they got away to a desolate place. And they got out of the way to a desolate place, which means they're getting away from people because there's times where you need to evaluate. And there's just times, come on, Floridians, you got to evacuate. That's what they're doing. They're getting along with Jesus. And they're going to be refreshed and replenished by Jesus, spending time with Jesus. This is not just, hey, we need to go play golf, boys. We need to go fishing, guys. Hey, y'all, we need to go have some leisure time. Great, good no problem with leisure time. Come on. I'm all about saltwater therapy. Let's catch some waves. All about it. It's good. Not what this is about. Too many of us are amusing ourselves to death. Jesus did not want to do that at all. He's coming together to get these guys out of the rhythm of work into the rhythm of rest. Do you do this? Jesus did. He was regularly in the rhythm of rest. We read in Mark 1, he regularly got away from the crowd and prayed. He regularly got away from people and spent time with the Father. He daily did it, not just only occasionally, but every single day he did it. We, we have to do this for our soul care. We need it. We need rest. And that rest is getting away with the Lord. It's spending time with him. God proved this to us when he created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. Why? He rejoiced in the work that he'd done. There needs to be a time when we come back and we rejoice in God and are satisfied in him. God proved that for us. He commanded us to get away and rest. This is why we have a, a day of rest like this day, which is the Lord's day. It's not like any other day. It's a, it's a day of rest, and we need it. And then Jesus needed to check in with his disciples. We might think that it's really stellar to work our fingers to the bone and to the place of exhaustion without refilling ourselves. We have a plaque out here, y'all. I'm going to finish up. We have a plaque out here, a quote from C.T. Studd. Keep it up. I love it. I still, want, I still want to repeat it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what we've done for Christ will last. Good word. C.T. Studd 
was a missionary who worked 18 hours a day, never took a break, never a vacation, never rested. Because he didn't, to keep up with his work, he became a drug addict, taking morphine pills prescribed to him by a doctor in Uganda. And the very mission organization he founded called him back off the field home because of that. None of us are built differently than each other. We all are built the same way. We're built to work (laughs) and we're made to rest. Jesus knew these guys needed rest. They needed mental rest. They needed physical rest. They needed spiritual rest. And Jesus was going to check in on them. What a pattern. What a rhythm. Spouse, husband, wife, are you checking in on your spouse? How's your heart? How's your heart? How's things going? What's going on in you? Dad, taking time to sit down with those kids, find out what's going on in their heart? What are they challenged with? What are they struggling with? What's going on with them inside? I mean, we keep up with batting averages and grangetes and we want to know their grades. But what's going on in their soul? I mean, we got to check in. We have to check in. Not only check out, but check in on those we care about. We need this. Jesus did this. There are three types of people who need to hear this today. There are some of you here today. You're working, 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 and you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just, it's just invigorating for you. You, you, don't, you. you don't feel wore out from your work, but I just want to remind you that we're not to grow weary in well-doing. Keep on. The the sun never sets on the ministry of this church. I am absolutely stunned on a regular basis as what goes on through the members of this church, whether it's jail ministry, prison ministry, ladies' men's ministry, going into schools, going into the communities, feeding people. People are hurting. We're there. Man, it's amazing. It's amazing. I just want to say to you, don't forget to take time to rest regularly and replenish your soul. But there's another group of you in here. You never get tired out for Jesus. You're tired for a lot of other reasons. The the theme park wore you out. The sun burnt you. You're busy with your moving up the ladder, but you can't truly say, I'm wore out in the assignment Jesus gave me. I could say to you, get to work. There's just too many people in this church for there not to be all of us doing the work. Our Bible study teachers need care group leaders. You know what care group leaders do? They do one thing. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty, they care. And you care, don't you? Every Bible study group should have a, 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 an overabundance of care group leaders. Every junior high, every high school, small group should have an overabundance of care group leaders who care about other people. You, what do I do in that role? Just care for them. I mean, when they're sick, pray for them. When they're going to have a hard test, pray for them, encourage them. When they have a success, rejoice with them. When they have a devastated, when they're devastated because something happened in their life, come alongside them. Spend time with them, care about them, just care. You can do that, can't you? We all must. We all must be in the work. There's some of us that just need to get busy. And there's some of you, thirdly, that just need to enter into the rest of the Lord because you never have. Jesus said it this way. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Why did he say that? He said that because there were people who were working themselves silly to get to heaven. And, and let me tell you, there's some in this room that are doing the same thing. You're just working hard to make sure that God's pleased with what you do. But salvation comes not because of your work, but because of his. Good works send you to heaven, but it's not your work, good works. It's his good works. Jesus, who lived for you and died for you, and he invites you into his rest, which is salvation. If you've never been saved, then today, why don't you get saved? Let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you that we have the opportunity to look at this text. We need it. We, it's really helpful for us. Father, I pray that we'll take time to evaluate our own lives in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?